My talk today is called Improve Developer Productivity with Ephemeral Environments. So this talk is based on my and my team's experience um, helping various companies uh, adopt ephemeral environments based on various use cases. Um, and my name is Adar Shah. I'm a founder of a company called CloudNet. We do cloud comprehension and orchestration. Let's see if the clicker works. It is off. All right. Okay, so let's quickly um, go through the agenda. Uh, I'll be talking first about the challenges affecting their productivity related to environments. Uh, then we'll give some real examples uh, from uh, my experience. What are the various use cases uh, for ephemeral environments? How to implement ephemeral environments? And there are various ways. I'm going to just go through one way that I called, uh, call environment as code. Um, and then if we have time, which I think we will, um, I'll have a quick demo uh, of ephemeral environments. Um, so before we get started, I just want a quick show of hands. Uh, how many people here uh, are, you know, platform engineers or DevOps engineers, folks who actually manage environments for, you know, product teams? All right, nice. Uh, how many folks are, um, you know, devs or people who are like, hey, someone else manages environments for us? Rest of it? Okay, all right. <laughs> um, and how many of you uh, have a very simple setup that, you know, I don't care about environments at all, you know? I just, you know, deploy, use Vercel or whatever to just deploy my app. No one. Wow. <laughs> all right. Um, how many of you think actually environment management is an issue? All right. Okay. All right. Nice uh, bunch of mixed uh, people, but apparently no one has a simple setup. Everyone has a complex setup. So my talk is perfect for you all. <laughs> Because I wanted to start with a caution and say, you know, uh, if you don't need complexity, you don't need to introduce. What I'm going to be talking today about uh, involves complexity, you know, automating stuff that you probably don't need in some cases. Uh, but looks like that's not a problem for you all. <laughs> all right. So before uh, I get into ephemeral environments, I just wanted to cover this one thing that um, actually came up in, in DevOps Day New York open spaces as well. Um, the shift left was the shift right conversation. And I know a lot of people are like, hey, why not just test in production? I have one environment, you know, I can just deploy, test everything in production, which is great. And it's a very good way to find issues. Uh, but I feel like it shouldn't be a shift left versus shift right conversation, but it should be more like shift left and shift right. And whatever your way to find issues faster and better, uh, I feel like you need a combination of both. And that's where ephemeral environments or CI uh, automated tests in your CI, uh, things that you can do sooner in your cycle uh, to find issues, um, that's good. But there are uh, things that you can test in production live and you, know, you can find issues and just recover from those. So I feel like uh, we should think about both, not one versus the other. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the challenges that affect uh, developer productivity, right, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, that is related to environment management. So first one is configuration drift, right? Um, so one thing is like, why should I even touch my environment, right? Like it's working and, you know, I don't need to touch it. It's been working forever. Uh, you know, one of the major challenges is configuration drift. So configuration drift occurs over a period of time when there are changes made to your environments um, that are not recorded. You know, sometimes a failure happens or someone made a change because there is an issue and they forgot to patch all environments. Or, you know, you have some kind of a memory leak in one of the, the VMs. Uh, things drift apart and then the environments you know, are not the same anymore, right? So my dev environment versus QA or production, or even within my production environment, I mean, have different VMs who are in different state. So configuration drift happens because of long-lived environments, 
you know, you have servers provisioned, you know, three years ago, and you just keep patching them, right? Because of that, conf configuration diff happens, and people spend a lot of time, uh, you know, resolving those issues. Second one is replicating environments is a pain. So now, uh, let's assume you have an issue in production, you want to troubleshoot, you know, and you can't make changes in production or try out fixes. Uh, and you want to have a production-like environment. Uh, if it's an easy enough setup, um, you can easily replicate environments, including data in some cases, and you can uh, reproduce issue, troubleshoot, and even have a fix. Um, another one, this is actually a real example where uh, teams have monthly cloud budget. Um, I used to uh, help a customer, like one of the big, um, you know, stock exchanges, um, and they had monthly budgets for each team. Uh, they had to comply within, you know, that budget, and they had various buckets like experimentation, or if they want a new setup or a new environment, try new cloud, uh, they had budget and it was actually approved by the finance team because their cloud bills were uh, a lot. Um, so why is this a dev productivity issue though? It is because that's a constraint put on developers where they have to, you know, work within that, those constraints. And a lot of times, you know, people were waiting for approvals from the finance team, for example, or other issues that were slowing them down. Um, and then, yeah, I mentioned uh, the configuration drift, but yeah, like I've seen devs spend a lot of time troubleshooting mysterious bugs because they can't easily reproduce that uh, because it's only happening in production or, you know, it is specific to a certain type of data that's only in production. Um, here are some real examples from, from my experience. Uh, so yeah, uh, a lot of places I've worked with where devs wait for weeks, you know, hey, I have to create a ticket. There's some other team, like, you know, platform team or, or uh, a central team that needs to provision stuff. They don't have fully automated systems, self-serve systems. They kind of uh, spend time, you know, uh, replicating their infrastructure as code stuff or do stuff manually. And they wait weeks to get an environment that is fun fully functional before they can start using it. Uh, I already mentioned monthly cloud budget. It is a real example from uh, uh, especially one company that I worked with. Um, shared environment is broken due to someone upgrading a dependency, right? So a lot of places you have shared dev environments where people uh, you know, share that environment or they have a hybrid setup where they run a few things, like let's say front end locally on their machines, but they connect to APIs that are deployed in a shared environment. Uh, someone is trying a new version of a dependency, they upgraded that, and now they broke the rest of the people, right? So slowing everyone else down. Um, if you don't have a production-like environment, like I mentioned, for your testing needs, I have seen that over and over again where, you know, people are like, hey, I have to wait to test certain things because, you know, I'm not able to test that before it goes to production. And then, yeah, once I'm done, if I'm experimenting with something, um, I should be able to easily tear down stuff because I don't need that anymore. So uh, because of that, I've seen a lot of companies have resources that are just, you know, lying around because they didn't clean them up appropriately. So what is an ephemeral environment? And we'll then talk about how that kind of helps solve some of these challenges. Uh, so ephemeral environment, um, also called as dynamic or short-lived environment, uh, is an idea of provisioning an environment on demand. I need an environment, I should be able to provision that. And when I'm done using that environment, I should be able to destroy that easily. Uh, it is a useful technique to test your infrastructure as code or your applications that run on that, that infrastructure as code without a, a need to keep it running all the time. Now, I know here I mentioned test your ISC and applications. But I feel like it's more than just testing them uh, while you deploy your apps, but also managing your production environments. And I'm going to talk about that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so when I say environment, what does that mean? Um, here's an example of an environment. And um, an environment means anything you need to run your business applications, right? It is your infrastructure, your applications that are deployed on those infrastructure, 
um, any state management stuff that happens, um, any databases that you have that are associated with running your business applications, um, any third party dependencies that you have, right, that you rely on uh, to run your business applications. Um, now, at what level do you make them ephemeral or automate? Depends on your, your needs. You might not want to spin up and spin down your networking layer every time, but you might want to do it from somewhere down the stack or up the stack. Um, so yeah, now let's talk about some of the use cases uh, that ephemeral environments uh, can be helpful. So yeah, one I already mentioned, but developer environments, right? Um, uh, shared environment issues that I have seen that uh, kind of cause slowdown and uh, you know decrease developer productivity. Uh, so if there are ways uh, for you to provision new dev environments, if you want to try to upgrade a dependency or upgrade a new version of a framework, you should be able to do that without affecting the rest of your team. Uh, and then, yeah, once you're done with that, you should be able to tear down. So one of the use cases where um, this comes helpful is, is your development setup. Then your test environments. Uh, here, there are a few things you can do. One, one of the things is testing product features. One of the, the things that um, uh, you can do here is basically have an easy way to test environments and product features, especially major ones that people need to manually check. So let's say I have um, a UI change that I want someone to test and check out how the user experience is. Uh, having an environment where you can deploy, share a link, uh, and they can test those changes. Uh, I already mentioned production issue, uh, troubleshooting, um, and then also performance and load testing. So uh, if you want to be ready, I mean, I know Matt mentioned that they did, uh, and they did great with their uh, Super Bowl commercial, and they were testing stuff in production, which is great if you are able to do that. But if you have an environment where you can do some of that testing and simulate that stuff, that's also an option that will allow, give you some more confidence about those changes. Um, some of the other use cases, uh, preview environments. So one of the things um, about continuous delivery is building quality in, uh, which means that you should be able to test stuff, automated tests, but also, like I mentioned, if there is a change that you want uh, your product teams to check, if you are able to have preview environments that deploys those changes before you merge a PR or after you merge a PR before you go to production uh, so that you know, they don't find it surprising in production. Um, experimentation is a big part of what we all do, right? Um, and if there are easy ways for you to spin up stuff, try out new services, um, you know, you want to try uh, new, new features, new uh, versions of, of these services, you should be able to experiment and when you're done, uh, kind of spin that down. I've seen uh, teams spend a lot of time kind of saying, hey, I want to experiment this uh, on AWS. They would go spin up stuff manually. Um, it, it just, you know, try to figure out how to set up my networking layer. How do I, you know, spin up a Kubernetes cluster? What version should I use? Um, you know, if I need databases, what kind of stuff do I need? Uh, removing all that uh, and actually focusing on what you want to actually experiment on uh, is another use case. Um, I already mentioned, but testing major upgrades. Um, I want to upgrade my Golang version from X to Y. Um, I want to be able to do that uh, without affecting other folks and doing it in a shared environment before I uh, do something in a shared environment. Demo environment, if you work with sales teams um, and um, you know sales engineers who are working with customers to have demos, some demos are very specific demos that they want to have custom features or something that is specific to a customer they want to show. They should be able to provision those environments uh, once the demo is done. And if it is one-off demo, uh, they should be able to spin that uh, down. Another one is sandbox environments. Depending on what you work on, I mean, a lot of companies, let's say you have um, uh, uh, a service that gets deployed on a Kubernetes cluster, right? I, I know a few of the sponsors have services, uh, you know, that you can either deploy on Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so let's say a service mesh, mesh uh, uh, product. 
And a lot of them have to work with their customers to deploy these, test them out. Uh, so they need sandbox environments to collaborate with their customers. And I have seen companies spend so much time kind of you know, manually reprovisioning this. And if they are not able to easily replicate that, it just adds to slowness and reducing the productivity of devs. Um, and then once they are done, they should be able to tear them down. Now here's a, a interesting one, which I think is falls in the, under this category is the blue-green deployments, because they are also, to me, a short-lived environment. Uh, you have a blue environment uh, that you provision that's running in production. Now you have a new version of your application ready to be deployed. Can you actually spin up a brand new setup that is a green version of your app, test out everything looks good, and switch it, and then bring down the blue environment, right? So they live, these environments only live um, until you have a new version that comes so that you, you spin them down. So here are some of the use cases that I've seen. I, I know there are other use cases as well, especially you know, a lot of people doing machine learning stuff. If you want to train your models, so one of the things that uh, I've done in the past is you know, the training process can take forever sometimes. You know, in, in one case, I know it used to take days. And you want to spin up your um, training environment with a bunch of GPUs. And when you are done, you want to provision them down because they are really expensive. Uh, so that's another use case. So yeah, those were the use cases. And I'm going to talk about one way to achieve ephemeral environments. There are a lot of different ways. Uh, obviously, you use infrastructure as code or any kind of automation tooling to automate your infrastructure bit. Whatever you want to automate uh, and whatever level you want to make it ephemeral. Um, like I said, you don't have to spin down your network layer all the time, you know, or spin that up. Or maybe you want to do that, depending on your use case. Uh, but, you know, maybe your Kubernetes cluster, you don't want that running in all the environments. Um, and then, obviously, you can use tools like Helm or customize to deploy your apps if you're using Kubernetes, if you're not using it whatever else you have. Um, and then, yeah, you can write simple pipelines to automate those. Um, but yeah, this is uh, one way, environment as code, and, and let, let's just dig into it. So at a high level, uh, what I mean when I say environment as code is uh, you have code that allows you to declaratively define your entire environment. Now, in this case, it could be your networking, your EKS, your database, uh, yeah, you know, like your, your website or all the APIs or whatever it, it means. And then when you define, you push it to your source control and it picks up the change and provisions these resources in the right order, right? Um, now today I know we do this, a lot of people using pipelines, which is great. Uh, but in my experience, as the complexity grows, the pipeline code is really messy. Like I've seen people write thousand lines of code in Circle CI or some other language, uh, some other pipelining code that um, you know has all these if elses based on environments. Um, so yeah, here's another example, like view of this, which is, hey, I have all these automation tools that I use. Um, is there a way to kind of abstract that out and make it simple so that I don't have to, you know, as a dev, deal with all these automation tools? Um, so yeah, like uh, one way kind of uh, using the Lego analogy, kind of differentiating between infrastructure or app as code versus environment co as code is, um, to me, infrastructure or app as code is like building your individual Lego pieces, right? So you build your various in infrastructure resources or deploy your apps, but you still need to glue them together to get something meaningful. To me, a production environment means everything, right? My networking, my database, my apps, my third-party services, my databases, all that stuff. So to me, environment as code is something that automates uh, connecting those Lego pieces and gives you a Lego toy, which is what uh, is more meaningful to me. Um, so yeah, here's a, uh, I think we already talked about this. Uh, I think I only have five minutes. So I'm going to quickly go over this. But yeah, it's, it should be declarative. Uh, environment as code, it's an abstraction that helps you manage uh, your entire environment. 
There's a control plane that manages the state of the environment uh, and all the relationships. Uh, so yeah, the difference between writing a pipeline code is how you achieve um, your um, whatever environment you want to do. But an environment as code is more like what you want, and it's more declarative. A quick uh, uh, flow in, in that you, you write your code, it's declarative, it's self-service, you push it to GitHub. Uh, there's a control plane involved that provisions uh, your, your uh, environment, but it kind of detects uh, the drift. Uh, there's a state management happening at an environment level, similar to how Terraform does state management for, I would say, individual components. And then it kind of provisions stuff in the order that uh, you want. And if you want to tear it down, it's, again, simple. You push a change, maybe set the flag to tear down true. Uh, and again, the, the control plane kind of detects what to do. But then this, the destroy happens from the bottom because you want to destroy resources uh, from the bottom and, and then all the way up. Um, I'm not going to go through uh, the attributes uh, just because of time. I have a separate talk. If you are interested, you can look up uh, on environment as code. Uh, but yeah, you can also basically use GitOps for this uh, and provision stuff. Um, so what about databases? I wanted to quickly touch on that. Um, I know databases is a big thing when you want to spin up and spin down stuff. Uh, a few of the techniques uh, uh, I've used is like, you know, have a snapshot ready that uh, you can easily, when you provision back your environment, you, you can easily attach it to it. Uh, you can seed the data when you provision your environment. So let's say you have certain things you need before you, the environment is useful. So you can use data seeding for that. Um, obviously, you want to handle sensitive data. So let's say you're in healthcare, you have HIPAA uh, compliant data that you want to anonymize. Uh, I know there are various tools to do that, do that, or you can write something simple that actually does that. So definitely uh, database is a big part of it, uh, and it is the most challenging part as well. But yeah, if you have that, and I work with customers who just have a snapshot that has anonymized data that they hook up every time they provision that environment back up. Um, so yeah, how does ephemeral environment help um, improve developer productivity, right? So it reduces configuration drift because now you have confidence in how you provision stuff and tear down stuff, and you don't have those long-lived environments that I was talking about earlier. Um, you know, it makes replicating environments easy. So you have a special use case that you want to test. You can easily replicate those environments uh, using the same setup and automation scripts that you have for your production environments. Um, it reduces cloud cost because you don't have resources running all the time. Um, I have folks who basically uh, at 8 o'clock in the morning, auto uh, automatically provision an environment. 5, 5.30, it automatically brings down uh, on a scheduled way. And you're not running expensive resources if you, when you don't need them. Yeah, <laughs> but most importantly, it gives you confidence about your provisioning and tearing down process, uh, even for production, right? So if you do blue-green, you're spinning up your whole stack. You have confidence rather than, you know, hey, six months um, after something happens, or like there is an issue happening and you don't know how to have confidence about your provisioning and tearing down process um, is an issue. Um, yeah, I, I'm not gonna go through this. Uh, it's just something you probably know and we don't have time, but yeah. Uh, again, do I really need to do all this? You know, start with problems you're having today rather than, hey, I need to start doing this. Uh, measure changes, learn and iterate, I mean, like anything else. Uh, so by that, that's the talk. Um, I don't think I have time for a demo, right? Am I? No. Okay. All right. So if anyone wants a demo, um, uh, get hold of me. Thank you, everyone.